Welcome back to The Wheel on the School, Chapter 13. Chapter 13, Flotsam and Jetsam. The storm lasted three more days. Behind the dike, the ebb tide struggled against the might of the wind in the great elementary need of a tide to obey its laws. But the wind won and held the tide water to the shore. Even in ebb tide, the sea lashed angry and deep. Great waves roared and stormed halfway up the straining dike. Over the houses and village, the wind shrieked. It screamed along the tiles on the roofs, and often it, lo it loosened tiles and sent them crashing. Already, several windows had been broken by flying roof tiles, and the blinds of the houses in Shora were kept shut throughout the storm days to protect the windows. Inside the cluttered little houses, the fishermen fretted at the delay in the confinement. For five days now, each fisherman had been cooped up in his little house. One living room, a hall, and a kitchen. The living room, with its bedding from the closet beds, piled over every chair, seemed always to be in the long, awkward process of bed making. The restless fishermen were growing irritated by the closeness of the dark, shut-up houses, the smell of their own stale tobacco smoke, the babies and little children that seemed always to be underfoot. The old ch older children could be got out of the way by sending them to school, but there, it seemed to the irritated fishermen, they did little but agonize about the storm and what it would do to the storks. Mighty little book knowledge was being rammed into their worried heads these miserable, nerve-wracking days. The men were getting as fed up on talk of storks as they were on playing dominoes. On the fifth day of the storm, Lena's father finally swept the whole mess of dominoes off the table so hard that two of them landed in the ash box of the peat stove that his wife was just emptying. You can't eat dominoes, he exploded. It seems when I'm not holding a half-wet tot, I'm keeping older kids quiet with dominoes. Dominoes! It's getting so I'm getting spots before my eyes. He grabbed his oil coat and charged to the door. I'm readying the boat. By tomorrow, this should be over. There's a new note to the wind. He looked at his wife, who was trying to extract the two dominoes, from the hot ashes into which they had sunk. Oh, I know I'm the clutter here. Me and my long legs need a sea. All the fishermen seemed to have reached the breaking point at about the same time. Men came striding from different little houses. The others, hearing their voices in the street, hurried out after them. On the dike, they got busy with nets and gear, in spite of the struggle and double work in the storm. They worked, yelling at each other against the wind, and the wind carried the sounds into the houses. It was good to hear busy sounds outside again. The women breathed more easily and started cleaning the impossible rooms. Maybe tomorrow we can open doors and windows and let in air, Lena's mother said hopefully. Who knows, maybe even sunshine. It'd be so good to see the sun again. It had to wait. Even the fishermen had to give the sea and storm another night. If there were a new tone to the wind, and if the storm were flagging, as the fishermen insisted, the sea did not seem to know it. As if by habit, it lashed on and churned and raged behind the dike. But toward night, there was the slightest veering of the north wind, so slight it could be noticed only by a fisherman. The fishermen stood on the dike in a solemn group, scenting the wind change, studying the scudding, angry crowd, clouds, almost tasting the change in the salty spray that the sea hurled up at them. To them it all spelled the change, the going out to sea again. They'd be ready to go in the morning, no matter if the sea had not yet reacted to the coming change. They knew the storm was broken the sea would settle down in time. Fortunately, it being Thursday, this was the day of the arrival of the newspaper. 
a two-page closely printed weekly sheet that brought news, news of the rest of the co country into far lands. Only one copy of the newspaper came to the fishermen of Shora. It passed from hand to hand until the village had literally read it to pieces. No dominoes this long evening. A man had to read the paper when it came, thoroughly, completely, down to the last inky word, but fast. Somebody else was waiting for it. The men read it out loud that Thursday evening so that busy wives and older children could share in it in it at one in it at one and the same time. They watched the clock as they read. By such an hour it had to be carried to the house next door. The reading of the paper was dull stuff for the children. Children, dominoes was more fun, but grown ups tired so soon of games. Now there was little to do but play with the dominoes all by yourself. Set them all up on end in a long file like soldiers, then topple the first one and watch them all topple in turn. That way you did some good too. It kept the younger children interested and quiet so that they didn't interrupt the all-important, almost sacred reading of the newspaper, full of the dull doings of parliaments and ministers and foreign diplomats in strange countries with strange, faraway-sounding names. Alka sat listening to his father's reading. His father held up the paper to, to point out an unpronounceable word to Alka's mother. Alka glanced at the paper. Suddenly, his attention froze on the word Africa. It seemed to leap out at him from among all the other words in the column. He forgot to push down the dominoes he had set up in a curving row for his little brother, Jan. He read, It is thought that the five-day violent storm raging over the country and all Western Europe will have done unaccountable harm to the influx of storms from Africa. The storm came at the height of the migration. It is feared that all the storks winging their way overseas when the storm hit may have perished. We in Holland can expect most of our nesting places on barns and roofs and in stor stork rookeries to remain empty this year. The situation is the more tragic in that of recent years the stork population was beginning to show some gains again. It is estimated that this will set them back for years to come. Aka had read. Now he sat still, as if spelling out to himself the meaning of the stilted, heavy words. It was hard to believe, but there it stood in print in the paper. One thing made it horribly believable, though. His father had skipped the item about the storks when he had read that page of the paper out loud. Push him, Aka's little brother Jan pleaded, his eyes on the curving row of dominoes marching across the table. Push him, Aka. Aka pushed them. Then he slipped from behind the table. I've got to go see Pierre and Dirk a minute, he said. His mother looked up. Now in the storm and rain, she asked mildly, but she had her mind on what Aka's father was reading. Aka drew on a jacket. Bareheaded, he dashed into the rain-swept street. Nobody knew. In every house where the paper had already been read, the news of the storks perishing in the storm had been kept silent. That made it all seem worse. Lena joined Alka and Dirk and Pierre. They went on to Yella's house, then to Elka's. Everybody had to know. But what was there to do? It was in the newspaper, so it was to be believed. It was news. It was a fact. There was nothing they could do. It was the storm. God brought storms and hurled big storks into the ocean to become food for fish. They sat stunned in Elka's kitchen. But so some will get through, Lena said desperately. She was begging, begging for them to agree rather than just stating a fact. Yeah, but those have gone to all the old places. You know what Giannis said. Only the new storks from last year would look for new places like our school to nest. And Giannis told us Sunday in church it was the young storks that still had to come. And it's those that went down in the sea. I wonder if Giannis knows and the teacher. 
Oh, the teacher would know. Well, maybe we ought to tell Giannis. Let's go tell Giannis. But could we all go over there? Yella asked doubtfully. All us kids? We've never been. But they had to do something. They couldn't sit still. Yana came to the door and let the children stand outside in the rain and wind. Will you tell Giannis the storks are all down? Pierre asked somberly. Are those the kids? Giannis shouted from inside the house. Well, bring them in. I sort of thought they'd come after that newspaper story. They trooped in, in single file. The boys ripped their caps off and fussed with unbuttoning jackets. So Lena had to take the lead behind Yana down the hall into the kitchen, where Yana sat drinking a cup of hot chocolate milk. Pour some more water into the chocolate milk and we'll all have a cup, he told Yana. Giannis was joking. Even after that awful news in the paper, he sat there joking and sipping chocolate milk. The children, even Pierre, found nothing to say. Giannis, did you read what it said in the paper? Lena asked at last. Her voice quavered. Then Giannis blew up. Read it? Sure, I read it. Read it so many times I know it by heart. But don't you kids stand there and tell me that you took that silly scribbling to heart? There he sits, that inky printer, in a cellar somewhere in Amsterdam, buildings all around so high that he can't even see as much as a square foot of the sky. He and his inky fingers in his cellar. Giannis drew indignant breath. Why, I'll bet you he couldn't even tell a stork from a rooster. Storks don't settle in cities, but he knows. Even knows that all the storks drowned in the sea. Was he out in a boat in the storm? Did he see them fall in the sea? Did he see stork bodies washed up against the dike? No, he didn't. Giannis fiercely answered himself. He had a pail full of ink to get rid of, and he had to fill his paper with words. There was a little blank spot he still had to fill, so he put something about storks in that leftover space. Anything he could think up. It is thought. It is feared. It is estimated, he quoted derisively from the newspaper. Who thinks it? Who fears it? The printer? Words. All fancy words to worry kids in shore with. Giannis glared at them all. He looked at his big hands. If the hateful printer that Giannis had imagined had been there, he would have gone hard with him and his inky neck. Did any of you see any stork bodies wash up the dike? Giannis asked. No, Lena said. No, but then we didn't look either. It was absolutely the wrong answer. Giannis looked at Lena as if she were the hateful printer. Printers! Ink! Words! Giannis snorted. Look, those storks make that trip twice a year. Look, if that printer came out of his cellar and went to sea in a boat in a storm, he'd go down before he got ten feet from the dike. But your fathers don't go down, do they? They bring a boat through. They know about storms. Well, so do storks. Sure, a few may go down, but those storks just don't fold their wings and let themselves be dumped in the sea to become fish bait. There's too, they're too smart to let themselves be caught over water in a storm. They knew it in their bones long before the storm fell that a storm was coming, and they didn't have to read about it in any printer's silly newspaper. Giannis had made the contest of wits between the wise storks and the stupor printer so vivid it seemed real. He quieted down now as, as Yana passed out cups of steaming chocolate milk. No, you'll see. The storm will hold them up for a few days. The storm will have scattered them. But in a couple of days, you can start looking in the sky for storks again. They'll be coming just by twos, not by flights, because they let the storm take them over the land wherever it wanted, but not down in the sea. They'll come through. All but maybe make a few foolish, all but maybe a few foolish young storks making their first trip back. But you said Sunday, Giannis, 
that those were just the ones we need here in Shora, Yella said anxiously. You said young ones would look for a new place like Shora. The old ones will just go back to their old places. But that's just it, you young lunkhead, Yana shouted impatiently. Don't you see? The storm is going to help us because it scattered the storks. Some that otherwise would go to Germany will land here in our province of Friesland. And the storm will have held them up almost a week. They can't fool around looking for the old places hundreds of miles from where they've been blown. They're going to take what they can get, the first wheel they see. Over their cups, the children's eyes stayed hopefully on Janus. He was so sure. If anything, he was even surer than that printer in his newspaper. And Janus did not live in a cellar. For years, Janus had sat in a wheelchair doing nothing but watching birds. Janus knew, and before that, Janus had been a fisherman. He knew about the storm and sea and storms, too. The wind's been blowing all these days straight out of the sea, Elka said slowly. Even if the storks had been over the sea, they'd be blown way over the land, wouldn't they, Janus? Elka had thought of it all, had thought it all out. All of a sudden, the chocolate milk, milk started tasting much better. It was delicious. Janus took a long sip himself. Now that's thinking, he said to Elka, and that's the way it is. That's thinking it out. It isn't just printing words in a paper. It is thought. It is feared. It is estimated. It made him angry all over again. He snorted into his cup so hard it made bubbles. Another pailful of water into that chocolate milk, mother, he told Yana. We all need another cup to settle our nerves. That blasted newspaper. It suddenly felt chummy and cozy in the kitchen. At the stove, Yana made a little joke and everybody laughed. The children looked at each other and took sips of the delicious chocolate milk. Oh, it was good to sit here with Giannis after the awful scare. Giannis waited for them to finish drinking their hot chocolate milk. Now, he said, now I want you to come and take a look in the living room. Oh, no, Giannis, Yana protested. What'll they think? They're kids, Giannis said. No fussy housewives. Come on, everybody. They filed into Giannis's living room. There on the table lay Elka's wheel. It was all fitted together except for the iron rim that had sunk to the bottom of the canal. The whole floor was littered with rusty tin scrap, rusty tin scraps, wooded chips, and, and shavings. The room was a mess, but the amazed children had eyes only for the big ancient wheel on the table, wagon wheel on the table. Giannis had begun to fit pieces of rusted tin around the outside of the wooden rim, all the sections of which had been glued and nailed together. The spokes were all in place. The big hub rose high in the center of the living room table. Now, what do you think? Giannis asked proudly. Do you think... I'd go to all that fuss if I didn't expect storks. Rip the road out of the rope out of the cherry tree and use the tin that had been on it. The tin will hold the wooden rim together, and it's rusty enough so it won't blink and shine and scare storks. A few more pieces of tin to lap and nail around the rim. Another night for the glue to dry, and up she goes on Giannis's roof. That's if it's all right with you, Elka. Oh, golly, Elka said. Lena's eyes shone, but that's what the teacher said. If only we'd start. Now look, there's already a second wheel for a second roof. Who knows, maybe someday there'll be a wheel on every roof in Shora. And trees, Elka said. We're going to plant trees, too. But where are we ever going to find more we wheels? Yella said. It'll take years. Years, my eye, Giannis said. I've got it all doped out, kids. I can make wheels. 
All I need is wood, and that sea will bring us after, and that the and that the sea will bring us after every storm. Yes, Giannis, Pierre said eagerly. We'll hunt all along the dike from here to to Ternod even. Dal can tell us whenever he sees a good piece of driftwood on his walks, and we'll bring it in. I'll shape it into some kind of wheel, Giannis promised, just so it has bars across, like the spokes on a wagon wheel, for the storks to build a nest on, just so it's sturdy enough to hold a couple. Storks aren't fussy, and all I need is wood and tin, and it gives me something to do. Oh, and after this storm, there'll be all kinds of driftwood, Elka said. We'll pile, we'll pile your yard full. We'll bring it wherever you want it, Giannis, he promised eagerly. But not in my living room, Giannis said from the doorway. I've a hard enough time keeping it decent after peddling bread all day. But not in my living room, Giannis said from the doorway. I've a hard enough time keeping it decent after peddling bread all day. You're not making a wheel factory out of my living room and fi filling it full of wet, scummy flotsam and jetsam out of the sea. The shed in the yard will be our factory, Giannis decided on the moment. Hey, we'll need a sign. Wheel factory of the Shore Wheel and Stork Society, or something. The Shore Wheel and Stork Society, Lena cried. Giannis, that's good. Why, that's us. That's what we'll be. The next wheel has to go on Grandmother Sybil III's house, and the next one on Dawa's, and then we'll toss up to see which one of us gets the next wheel. And Giannis will be the president, and the teacher the vice president, and... No, Giannis said, I'm the vice president right now, and right now this meeting is adjourned, else all your mothers will think you perished in the night and the storm. Away with you and give me a chance to straighten up this room. It looks like we get no vote in the matter, Giannis said. Night, kids. Okay, I hope I said. No, Giannis said. I'm the vice president right now. And right now this meeting is adjourned. Else all your mothers will think you perished in the night in the storm. Away with you and give me a chance to straighten up this room. It looks like we get no vote in the matter, matter, Giannis said. Night, kids. Good night, Giannis. Thoughtful and excited, the Shore Wheel and Stork Society filed meekly out of the house. All right. See you in Chapter 14.